At issue this Sunday, the first ever trial of a former American president is unfolding in New York. Opening statements could start as early as Monday. We're going to talk about what Trump has to gain and lose during the trial. Plus, the Supreme Court this week is set to hear oral arguments on Trump's claim of presidential immunity. And America's biggest political family is backing Biden. The Kennedy family endorses Joe Biden for president. In a show of force against RFK Jr., the Kennedys come out on stage and throw their support behind the president. At Issue starts right now. Good Sunday morning and welcome to another edition of At Issue. I'm Matt Pritchard in for Corey Smith. And I'm Sue O'Connell. This coming week in New York, we are set to hear some dramatic testimony in former President Trump's hush money trial. We, of course, say it all the time, but we've never seen a moment like this in our nation's history. Trump is the first former president on criminal trial. Yeah, that's right. This past week was jury selection, and as of this recording, it looks like we should be on track for opening statements as early as tomorrow. Trump will be spending the coming days and weeks in court confronted by salacious and unflattering testimony about his personal life. He's pleaded not guilty to 34 counts of falsifying business records, and the charges stem from an investigation by the Manhattan District Attorney's Office into an alleged catch-and-kill scheme to bury negative stories about Trump before the 2016 presidential presidential election in a bid to influence the outcome. According to prosecutors, several people participated in the scheme, which involved paying people off to buy their silence and covering up the payments in Trump's business records. Two of those payments allegedly went to adult film star Stormy Daniels and model and actor Carrie McDougal. Both say they had affairs with Donald Trump, and outside the courtroom, well, Donald Trump spoke to reporters complaining about a gag order that keeps him from responding. The gag order has to come off. I should be allowed to speak. Every time I come out to speak to you, I want to be open because we did absolutely nothing wrong. The former president is required to be present during the entire trial, which could last up to eight weeks, significantly limiting his time on the campaign trail. I was in New York for day one of the trial, spoke with supporters and protesters that gathered outside. The lifetime of lying, being a con man, um, grifting, um, you know, fraud. There are repercussions and consequences to breaking the law. I really do believe that he's a victim of weaponized government and a two-tier justice system. We're just evil people, so continue to be evil because the more disgusting you are, the more we're going to win. Now, people were traveling from all over to come and support former President Trump. And I say travel because New York City is a Democratic stronghold. President Biden won Manhattan in 2020 with 85 percent of the vote. So finding jurors who are impartial or unaware has been a very tall order, if not impossible at times. Both sides questioned close to 200 potential jurors. Two of the first seven sworn in actually had to be dismissed. But as of this recording, we have a 12-person jury seated, plus those six alternates. What a trip. So, Matt, you were obviously in New York, you mentioned. What were your impressions of the crowd and what was happening? Yeah, so you've sort of got two separate stories going on. You have what's happening in the courtroom and then you have what's outside. Inside, mm -hmm. you sort of have the typical decorum you would expect from a judge overseeing a criminal trial and trying to treat Donald Trump like any other uh, defendant. But outside, it's much like what we've seen throughout Donald Trump's political career. You have supporters, you have protesters waging war against one another because of how they feel about Donald Trump and the policies that he's pushing forward. But of course, on the protest side of the coin, they see this as a moment where Donald Trump should be held accountable. His supporters say this is just getting in the way of their guy having a chance at running for president yet again. And so same old story in a lot of ways, but we're going to see it playing out over the next week, or so. <clears throat> All right, let's bring in our panel, though, to talk through the week that was. We have Jaquetta Van Zant, host of the Politics and Prosecco podcast, Jennifer Nassour, former chairperson for the Massachusetts Republican Party and president and founder of the Pocketbook Project. Thank you both for coming in. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thank you. So yeah. let's start with this Trump trial, and I want to start with you, Jennifer. What impact do you think this is having on Republican voters as they watch this all play out? Well, I think that there's, you know, a couple of schools of thought. I mean, I think, think that there are some that think it's totally embarrassing. And, th and some, like you heard in that video, that, you know, this is an abuse of the judicial system. I mean, look, at the end of the day, I think civics should be taught 
all through school. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't just be one year. It should be every single year because I think that this is a phenomenal example of how people forget that there is a separation of powers. The executive, the legislative, and the judicial. And the judicial holds itself out. They are not political. They they are going in. These jurors, you you would be living under a rock if you didn't know who Donald Trump was <laughs> or anything about it, the man's character. And so, of course, you're going to find people who know about him. The difference is you need to find jurors who are going to be impartial, mm -hmm. that really want to work hard, that are smart and can see facts and not who the person sitting in front of them is. Jaquetta, let's talk about the, the aspect of this, which I think is dawning on uh, Donald Trump, is that he has to be in this courtroom. The last trial that he attended, the, the, the punishment phase of the, the fraud trial, he wanted to be there. He has to be here for this. He may be off the campaign trail for four to six weeks. Is this helping Joe Biden? I don't know if it's helping Joe Biden, but I definitely think it's going to be detrimental to Trump. He won't be able to have that tangible, I can reach out and touch you effect. In any campaign, whether it's Democratic or Republican, when your candidate is absent, it is going to be a bad look for you. Mm -hmm. His base is going to base, and they're going to stay there, and they will do the best that they can to rally. But I think, as Jen said before, with that split, you're going to see it widen because he won't have that direct or face-to-face -face contact with his uh, voters. Well, and sort of building off that, Jennifer, I mean, he's found his way to get in front of cameras, whether it's in the courthouse or perhaps even going out to a, a Harlem bodega to talk <laughs> with supporters out there, just people that were out on the streets. So does he need to find these opportunities while he's stuck in New York City? It's Donald Trump. Yeah, right. I mean, is that, how is that even a question? Yeah. The man is, you know, he is a reality TV star. Mm -hmm. He has made money off of his persona. So, you know, I think that him being in a courtroom, he wants, he really wants this to happen fast and be over with so he could get back on the campaign trail. But he's getting free media every single day. It is dollars his campaign does not have to spend. And every time he walks out of that courtroom, he is going to open his mouth and, and all the cameras and all the people are waiting there for him. And he'll never be at a Harlem bodega. That's never. fair. <laughs> <laughs> Just yeah. that once, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Jaquette, let's talk about the, the jury selection. Um, you know, it's, I, I've, been, I've been sitting, we're going to talk about this a little bit, at yeah. the Karen Reed trial at the jury selection, and I've been really struck about the command to us as, as citizens. The, the government only asks us that we have to do a few things. One, show up if we're drafted, <laughs> file our taxes, yeah. right? And if we're called for jury duty, show up. That's all we really have to do. And I'm wondering if you think that they have been accomplishing finding, you know, independent-minded jurors, open-minded jurors, jurors who can uh, look at evidence and not say, okay, I hate Donald Trump, I love Donald Trump, but this is the evidence I'm going to look at. Have they been successful? I, well, they're seated now, so we know that they've picked the people. But it's going to be hard, you know, to sort of separate the person from the personality. Um, I think that this is a very clear-cut, black and white, dry, you know, clear-cut case of this is what he did. This is in violation of the law. And I think people are going to look at that. This is not about his personality. This is not about how you may personally feel about him or what he did, um, even with, you know, the hush money to Stormy Daniels. But this, I think the facts are so clear. And, and I... What I think is going to happen is you might have a few people that waver, but if you have someone, a strong foreperson, and I saw a couple of the dismissed jury, and they said, listen, um, I'm not a fan of Donald Trump, but I was here to show up to do my civic duty, and I think a lot of people, hopefully, they'll do that. Jennifer, what's your confidence level, I guess, with, with, with who's been put forward in this process? Yeah, I mean, I think that you, you can't question the system, because once we start questioning the system, the system falls apart. Mm -hmm. And I think we can all agree, you know, at least here at the table, that we're concerned about democracy and making sure that we can, you know, withstand it in these times. And so I don't want to question the, the integrity <laughs> of, of the jury pool. That's what Donald Trump is doing. What I'd rather see is, again, smart jurors, hardworking jurors, jurors who are looking just at the facts. And again, like Jaquetta said, not looking at the person, but looking at what this is about, the substance of the case. Yeah. Of course, we also know that this is not the only criminal case that is facing Donald Trump. The Supreme Court will hear oral arguments this week on the former president's immunity claim when it comes to special counsel Jack Smith's January 6th case. We know Trump gave three of those justices their job, swinging the court into a conservative majority. But even so, they have often ruled against Trump's interests. Jaquetta, what's your confidence level that this move uh, will come through, I guess, for the Supreme Court? What will they do as they hear this particular situation? So this is really where the rubber is going to have to meet the road. Yeah. 
I know that, you know, he's been able to swing the court for a majority of conservative people, but they are the people in charge of making sure that they stick to the law and they enforce that law. So I'm hoping that, again, going back to person versus personality, that they do what we have tasked them to do as a Supreme Court, which is you are the last stop. You are supposed to uphold the law. And this is going to be a chance for Donald Trump to see that he is not above the law. Hmm. You know, Nixon tried that. And, and, you know, even with this case, you, you don't go against the IRS, the biggest gang in the country. <laughs> and so you can't win against them. And I think the Supreme Court is going to have to prove that nobody is above the law, including the president of the United States. Hmm. Jennifer, are you concerned that Clarence Thomas uh, <laughs> is sitting on this Supreme Court? Uh, I know they passed a code that they all agreed to, but no one is making them follow the code. His wife, Ginny, had been sending texts around January 6th. People are concerned about Clarence Thomas. Are you concerned about Clarence Thomas? I'm not. Again, I don't, I don't want to get into the business of questioning the nine most honorable, noble people that sit on the Supreme Court out of over 330 <laughs> million people. I mean, if we were all that smart, we would be sitting there, right? Um, or and, I'd have a free RV. Or, so I could ride <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, clearly, I, I it's a private vote. jet flights yeah. and yeah all that <laughs> free vacations um, free vacations all around everyone mm -hmm. but but i think that you know really what we need to look at is is the again the court is going to view this Ha on the facts of the case, on what the oral arguments are said in the oral arguments. And I think at the end of the day, those nine jurors, they, they talk to each other, the justices. They are speaking to each other, and they have a tremendous amount of respect for each other. Mm -hmm. And so if someone looks like they're going off course, someone else will regulate. And by the way, they are not going to throw the reputation of the Supreme Court down the drain for Donald Trump, for Joe Biden, or anyone else. And it sets a domino effect for the other bodies of government, right? Mm -hmm. you know, you've got the White House and then you've got Congress. So I think if they screw it up, we might see a domino effect. You know, when we first started, though, we felt like there were four criminal cases or so coming at Donald Trump. He's been able to delay three of them. I mean, do we mark that up as success for the former president, being able to keep three away from the election and just one at trial? Well, I think his lawyers were able yeah. to do that, not him. Right. <laughs> and, and there's nothing, remember, there's nothing in the Constitution that says that you can't serve if mm -hmm. you're convicted of crime. <laughs> That's true. He might yeah. not be able to vote for himself. And the Constitution's a done deal. Like, you know, it's not like we can go back and rewrite right. it's it. It's not flexible. Yeah. No. <laughs> it's All right. unfortunately. Let's, let's turn over to the other side of the race now. President Joe Biden receiving a big endorsement this week. We mentioned it off the top of the show from the Kennedy family, choosing the current commander-in-chief over their own flesh and blood, that being Robert Kennedy Jr. Junior, who is running on a third party ticket. The Kennedys holding an event with Biden. Take a listen to what they had to say. We want to make crystal clear our feeling that the best way forward for America is to reelect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to four more years. Have you ever taken a tour of the White House? I sit in that desk and I look in front of the fireplace. To the left is a bust of Martin Luther King. To the right is a bust of your dad. And I remember to keep, keep looking and remind myself what they would do in tough calls. Jaquetta, you had quite the reaction to, to hearing all of that playing out there. I guess, what do you make of this whole endorsement thing? I, I hate to, you know, go to the age thing, but it just kind of reminds you of just, you know, your grandpa at the barbecue saying, like, mm -hmm. remember that time, you know, in 1902 or whatever, whatever. Um, but I think this is a good move uh, for Joe Biden. I think yeah. having the endorsement of the Kennedys over RFK Jr. is sending a clear message that they still believe in country over politics and even over flesh and blood. So I think this is a very, um, this is a win for him. Jennifer, who are they speaking to specifically? Are, are any RFK voters being swayed here? I don't think so. <laughs> I think that, you know, the RFK voters are going to be, listen, 70 percent of the country, facts are facts, 70 percent mm -hmm. of the country don't want either Trump or Biden. 60 percent of the country and growing think that both of these two are too old to be president of the United States. But RFK isn't that much younger than He's them. not, but he presents he presents a lot younger. Mm -hmm. His running mate is a lot younger. And She's Kennedy is associated with youth. Well, exactly. Let's, let's yeah. talk about Nicole Shanahan. Um, you know, I think she said the smartest thing about the abortion issue last week. She said the most articulate, nuanced <laughs> thing that I've ever heard any, any campaign person, any candidate ever say. Uh, she also comes with $2 million that she dumped into the RFK Jr. Uh, campaign. Um, do you think that she is raising RFK Jr.'s status 
I mean, so far, I mean, I'm saying a nice thing about the campaign, so clearly she yeah. is with me. Do you think yeah, she's I helping? Think, I think with millennials, I think that, again, the campaign has an air of freshness to it. I think that Kennedy name... Listen, it's a, it's a, whether you're happy with the Kennedys or you're not, it is a household name for 100 years. Everyone knows the name. And so I think that what the Bidens are worried about, the Biden campaign is worried, that this is going, RFK's campaign will take votes away from them. They're absolutely correct. Look, the th history is history. 2000, you know, George Bush won. There was a third-party candidate in 2016. Jill Stein had more votes then Donald Trump did in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin together when he beat Hillary Clinton. So when you're talking about numbers of votes and margins that small, mm -hmm. anything goes, and you worry about that third-party candidate who's getting traction. Jill Stein's still in the race, of course, so oh, we'll see what happens yeah. here. Oh, <laughs> All right, um, Jaquetta, let's talk about um, <laughs> New Hampshire. Uh, Governor Sununu, he's not Chris Sununu, not going to be um, running again. He's finishing his term. Former Senator Kelly Ayotte has spent a lot of time attacking Massachusetts and telling New Hampshire how they won't be Massachusetts if she gets elected, even though all we've had has been Republican governors for at least 500 <laughs> years before Moore Healy. Um, why is the Bay State getting dragged into this New Hampshire race? I, you know, I will say it and say it again. I think this is personal. I think this is her jealousy of Mora. And oh, I feel no. like, <laughs> and I feel like, you know, she's using, look, we are, we are an overtaxed state. It's expensive to live here, but we are the hub for education and, and medical uh, services. So, and you, you can't beat that. And so I think this is more personal. She wants to present as the young, hip, you know, person like Mara did here. And it's just not landing because we're not voting for you here in Massachusetts. So sure. we don't care what you think. This is certainly uh, personal, and, and because I like Maura Healy, I'm personally offended. Jennifer, <laughs> what, what do you make of the strategy? I mean, is this effective? We're going to disagree. Okay, with yeah, yeah, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. 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 Let's go. <laughs> now you get a little of the mudslinging uh, going on. So I, I take a different approach. So Massachusetts is looking at $1 billion that we have spent on the illegal immigration crisis going on here. I think that that is something that is notable and that people are going to start feeling $1 billion with a B. That's number one. Number two, between 2021 and 2022, the state has lost about 25,000 people between the ages of 25 and 40. We have a rapidly aging state here. So you have more people that are going to be 65 and older come 2030 than you have younger. So we're not going to have a baby boom. Why are people leaving? They're leaving because the high cost of housing. They're leaving because their jobs are remote. They're leaving. They just don't need to be here. So why would you stay? So Kelly Ayotte's message messaging is phenomenal. You don't have to be in Massachusetts. You could be back in Boston in 45 minutes. <laughs> like 100,000 people a day do from it, New Hampshire. Ex exactly, <laughs> right? And you can come over here if you want to go out in Boston. You don't need to live here. and You don't need to pay the taxes. And you don't need the, the regressive taxes, as far as I'm concerned. And, and looking at where we're going, because the budgeting for next year already shows that we're going to be close to a billion dollars behind again. So I think that there's a lot to be said for what Kelly Ayotte's messaging is. All right, let's stay in New Hampshire for just a second. You were on the Kelly, on the um, Nikki Haley campaign. Mm -hmm. Governor Sununu campaigned for Nikki Haley. Governor Sununu has said that he believes Donald Trump was involved in the January <laughs> 6th incidents. And he was a big Nikki Haley supporter. And now he says he will vote for Trump. What's your reaction to that? Can't tell people who to vote for. I mean, I disagree. I, I'm not going to said before. I believe in Reagan's principles, right? I'm not going to agree all the time. I, I don't agree with it. I think that you know he's probably getting in line and 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 doing what he thinks that the party needs. Um, I don't I don't like Joe Biden and I don't like Donald Trump. I mean, I'm not voting for. For Joe Biden, I think Joe Biden should go to a memory care facility. Who are you voting for? Um, I'm not telling you guys. <laughs> You're writing me in again? Official. I am, Sue. So right. You should be the president. All right. That's right. Yeah, but can I just say really yeah. quickly is it, that still doesn't make the argument for why, you know, she's coming after Massachusetts. And, yeah, I think Kristen Nuno is a very good example of why we can't trust folks in New Hampshire. He can't oh. make a decision or he can't even stand up and say this is wrong and I believe in this country more than I do of his politics. So I'm going to put him and Kelly Ayotte over there. I'm sticking with Mara. We appreciate both of your guys. <laughs>
guys' perspective on and all you guys these different bailed topics. bailed us out this week, too. So we did. Kudos to Very both much appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks well, both for coming yeah. in. Appreciate it. Yeah. Well, Sue, while I was in New York covering the Trump trial, you were covering another trial that we've been watching closely. It's been sending ripple effects from Boston all the way across the globe. Indeed. You may see just as many people and journalists descending on Dedham this week in Massachusetts. It's the highly anticipated Karen Reed trial, which is underway. And aside from the obvious, there are some key differences between how these two trials, the Trump and the Reed trials, have been functioning. We're going to talk about that when we come back. Welcome back to At Issue. For the rest of the show, we're pivoting away from mainstream politics to focus on what's set to be a nationally watched high-profile trial at being the Karen Reed murder trial. For the next few weeks and maybe more, all eyes around here are going to be watching what's unfolding inside the courthouse in Dedham. Yeah, not to mention on the outside, uh, Reed, of course, is accused of killing her boyfriend, Officer John O'Keefe, who was a Boston police officer. That was two years ago, January of 2022. Reed has pleaded not guilty. Prosecutors say she hit him with her SUV and left him in a blizzard. Her attorneys say she's being framed as part of a massive cover-up. The defense claims O'Keefe was attacked inside the home. And like Trump's trial in New York, a lot of people are showing up outside the court, holding signs, waving flags, beeping. So many people are showing up that the judge has issued an order establishing a buffer zone that prevents demonstrations within 200 feet of the courthouse. That decision has already been appealed to the state Supreme Court. So a similar energy outside the two courthouses. But inside, we're getting a completely different perspective. Unlike New York, Massachusetts allows cameras in the courtroom, removing any speculation about what's happening inside. So we will be able to witness every little moment, every expression that the jurors will be considering as they deliberate and listen to evidence. Here's NBC10 Boston legal analyst Michael Coyne. I would expect that by Tuesday, no later than Wednesday, we will be starting with opening statements and the introduction of the evidence, and the government will be calling their first witnesses in the case. And at that point, the case will begin and move relatively quickly. Michael is among a host of guests we have on every night after court as the trial moves on. Now, once jury selection is complete and both sides start to present their case, we will have special coverage weeknights at 7 o'clock. We'll be going in depth on the day's evidence and testimony, talking to experts who will help us break down the key information. In addition to that, we're live streaming the entire trial on NBC10Boston.com and on our various streaming platforms as well as on air on our sister station, NECN. So you've been down at the courthouse. You've been in the courtroom. What are your impressions from week one? Well, I've just been really struck by the device that we have seen on the national stage on politics is actually playing out here on this local trial. It's a lot of the same circus outside, um, and it's the same circus that we've seen at the Trump indictments and at the Trump trials, many outside activists um, making it really about them and having this celebratory experience hanging out at the courthouse when, in fact, you know, I, I feel like we have to keep saying this, a man was tragically killed. We don't know how yet. We'll see the evidence. And a woman is on trial for this murder. Mm -hmm. These are very important things. They're tragedies. We should be paying close attention to that part of it. You hinted at it a little bit there. What are the parallels, I guess, between Donald Trump's trial in New York City and the Karen Reed trial here in Massachusetts? Yeah, so besides the divisiveness, you have the accusations of government overreach, of mm -hmm. course, in both Trump many think has been overcharged. Karen Reed may be overcharged. And then there's the allegations of misconduct against the police and prosecutors in the retrial. That kind of reminds me of the concern some people have about the Trump investigation. In terms of any positives that you can sort of glean out of what you've seen from this process, anything you can bring up? Yeah, it was actually refreshing to be in the courtroom and hear the judge, who I know a lot of judges do this, instruct the jury, the possible jury, that they don't have to agree with a law to follow it, uh, that the requirement to be a good juror is just to be open-minded and to be fair, a lot like Jennifer Nassour was saying earlier. We all have biases, right? But we have to put the biases aside, take a beat, and work to a unbiased conclusion. And look, the behavior so far inside the Reed courtroom has been 
respectful, following the court rules, not quite like we're seeing at the Trump trial. So uh, sitting in watching the jury selection did give me some hope for democracy and for our legal system. Well, of course, we're going to continue to watch your coverage as we go along here. Again, you're going to see all of this taking place in our live coverage of the Karen Reed murder trial on all our different platforms. So be sure and tune in as we go through this process. Next week, we are taking a look at what could have been the 2024 Boston Olympics. Thanks so much for joining us this week. I'm Matt Pritchard. And I'm Sue O'Connell. Have a great day.